and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the head honcho of Pirate Gonzalez Games, probably want, probably wanted, but for raiding American American McGee's pirate ship three times running. But some know him only as Tim, the one and only Tim Gonzalez, developer of the upcoming Beacon TTRPG. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for thank you for coming on and put and putting up with my bad jokes. Um, I, I had, I had to make the American McGee pirate joke. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself because it was either I make a Monty Python joke, I make a Speedy Gonzalez joke, or I make an American McGee joke. I have flipped a coin. I have nothing to say about my whereabouts on any American coasts. (laughs) And plus... I'm pretty plus. I'm, I'd be disappointed if I if I'm the first one to do the Tim the Enta- Enchanter joke. Ah, uh, you might be actually. That is that is shameful. <laughs> there's you, always something. There's always something to latch on to. It's just a matter of of what what do you latch on to? And I I was gonna go with either that or the I don't think so, Tim. <laughs> There's a lot of good Tims out there. Yeah. Shout out to all the Tims. <laughs> <laughs> but I think fig- I figured it I figured it was an, an unwritten rule that ev- that every every gaming table has to make at least one Monty Python joke. Even more so since we're getting a Monty Python TTRPG later. See, I I do think it's a requirement and the interesting thing for me is I have not seen most of them. I have not seen a lot of cultural touchstones um, of media like that, but I feel like I have through the many years of playing games with people or hanging out with people. Um, eventually, you just kind of put things together, even if you haven't seen the source material. It's cultural osmosis is what I'll call it. Yes, that's a great way of putting it, and I feel very osmosed on a lot of these things, with uh, Monty Python being a key one. Because I, I'm pretty sure sh- I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure somebody somebody has reacted to some sort of HP loss by saying "tis but a scratch, a scratch your arms off." No, it isn't. But what's that? That I've had worse. Exactly. It, yep, yep. Every every table has it. Yeah, every table ha- every table has it. Some people some people end up cre- some people end up creating their own mythos. I I certainly have with the. With the with with stuff like keep it in your pants, Varric, because one of our because one of our players decided to Dragon Age. No, not no. <laughs> this because I think w- it would fit within Dragon Age as well. No, he had he. It was a different spelling. Um, we were running Numenera, and oh, that was that was a fun game. And he. For whatever reason, he de- he decided to be he decided to be the man whore to end all man whores. Um, until until the one time that he that he decided to that he decided to sleep with some Amazons and almost. Well, you you you're familiar with death by snoo snoo. <laughs> uh, yes, I actually am because I I started playing my first Dragon Quest game a little while ago. So yes. <laughs> Wait, Dragon Quest? Isn't that what it's from? But the d- death by S- death by snoo snoo is from is from the Amazon episode of Futurama. But um, I think there's something similar in Dragon Quest. Puff puff. <laughs> that's what it is. Yes. And that's right. a that's a Toriyama staple. <laughs> but to that to that end, given given the fact that Beacon is a TTRPG that's taking a lot of inspiration from Final Fantasy. I have to ask the chicken and egg question. Did you get introduced to video game RPGs first or tabletop RPGs first? And what was the introduction? Oh, that's tough. Um, 
or is it a case of both at the same relative time? It, it so it depends. So when I, like when I was real young, um, like had like got introduced to video games at a certain point, but we're talking about like um, like pre N sixty four. Uh, so there were RPGs, I don't think really counted as a genre at that point, but I do also remember as a kid going into Barnes and Noble and finding the D and D books in Barnes and Noble. Uh, it was, I think it was 3.5 was out at that time. Mm -hmm. And I loved reading those books. I understood that it was kind of a game, but I, 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 you know, I didn't buy them. I didn't have money to do that. So I just liked flipping through them, but didn't know that this was a game that you could actually play. And I didn't get to play it until years later when I was in high school. Um, and at that point, I had played some, you know, video game RPGs, really liked those. Uh, Elder Scrolls Morrowind, fantastic game. And I think that was like what I was playing when I got introduced to actually playing D and D like as a, as a tabletop game. Um, since they, you mentioned Morrowind, I have to ask the question, do you get triggered at the sound of cliff racers? <laughs> um, it, it's an iconic sound Definitely. for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is an iconic sound, but then again, Titanic is also a legend. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure some people would say that the Pinto is a iconic vehicle. It is. Yeah. Yeah. These are all <laughs> being things that jump to being something that jumps to mind. Isn't always a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you Are you familiar with the fact that somebody made a mod where you kill where you kill off one cliff racer and two more come back? No, this 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 sounds like you're giving them like the Legend of Zelda cuckoo uh, sort of treatment to the cliff racers, and that definitely does sound m much more terrifying than it already was. Well, somebody did a video where they where they did it, and it ended up generating so many cliff racers that it crashed. That sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but when it comes. Now, with since since um, since Final Fantasy is cer is certainly one of the influences, um, especially especially since you mentioned ten and fourteen, was ten your first foray into Final Fantasy? Yes, it was actually. The first one I ever played was ten, uh, and I still love that game to this day. Um, it. <laughs> I had also gotten a PlayStation 2. Like, this was, I'm pretty sure, way after it had already come out. Um, but it was the first one I had actually played. Because I think 11 was another MMO at that point. I didn't have mm -hmm. the ability to play those. Um, so, yeah, 10 was the first one I played. And I just loved the story of it so much. The whole cyclical nature of the baddie in that and the world, the whole spiral of death. And, and that like that sort of cyclical nature of the story and how the heroes were fighting not just to fight the threat that they were raised to believe was the threat, but to actually try and break the cycle mm -hmm. um, like was something I really wanted to do. And like that was like one of the themes from 10 that I brought into Beacon as well. Just that idea of a cyclical threat, a recurring threat that exists in your setting exists in your world and how that shapes it 10 is an interesting beast especially especially considering how it can it kind of threw it kind of threw a lot of people for a loop for one for one of the reasons that i liked it in the in the sense that it isn't tr a lot of people in in my opinion this might be a little bit of a hot take have a very limited view of certain genres, and fantasy is no exception. Uh, like I, I've seen, I've seen some people talking about how um, the upcoming FF sixteen is them returning to their fantasy roots, and I'm sitting there going, or, ra or rather, that is returning to medieval roots, and I'm like, motherfucker, Final Fantasy has never been full on medieval types of types of fantasy. 
And yeah, I feel 10, like very few of those of those of those RPGs actually are like they're fantastical in some way and not that rooted in reality. Um, what I mean by that is, you look at you look at say The Witcher. As much of a fantasy as it is, it is still heavily rooted in a certain region. That being that being Poland with the, with the with a few aspects of Hundred Years War. Germany and just a whole lot of Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, Lord of the Rings clear is clearly ba- is clearly based in the British the British Isles. As, as far as far as its particular motifs, Final Fantasy hasn't really ha- Final Fantasy and a lot of um, console style RPGs don't have that one particular culture that they that they build upon. It's more of a smattering of different ideas from all over the place. Even yeah. even across even across genres, but a lot of people have this idea that you have to you have to be tol- you have to be essentially be a Tolkien pastiche in order to be fantasy, and that's a very limited way to view things. It's why it's why I've joked about how if say D and D is supposed to be is supposed to be supposed to accompany supposed to be able to handle all kinds of fantasy, then. Um, why why would it expect me to use a shield if I if somebody wants to play samurai? How are you going to account for the whole sword and board being common in D anD D in a culture where shields aren't really a thing? Yeah, take any of those time, and you've got all right. You take a time period, and you go to different parts of the real world, and different things are happening at that same time. Mm-hmm. Or if you're trying to, I don't know, match. Uh, like almost like you're playing civilization. Like, are you trying to match tech periods? But even then, um, with different cultures, different areas of the world, they're going to be very different. The term I like to use is gestalt fantasy. Uh, When it comes to, when it comes to something like, when it comes to something like final fantasy. And the reason I bring this up with 10 is 10 has ten has a lot of leanings into um, Southeast Asia in general, and more specifically the Philippine Islands. Mm-hmm. I mean the fa- the fact that the fact that sin often often appears like a hurricane or a typhoon. I think that's an excellent case in point with that. Yeah, absolutely, and it felt like that when you were playing the game as well. I don't know, maybe that's one of the things I liked about Morrowind as well, and. That game, they just felt like, from my perspective, like born, raised in America, this is what I'm used to, and American history is what I was raised on. So finding these other worlds with these completely different histories, these different uh, biomes, even if they're inspired by another part of the real world, it's an area I wasn't familiar with. So it was a cool, you know, cool experience to, you know, see these things and be introduced to them as well. And that was one mm-hmm. of the that was a neat thing about ten as well. Yeah. And the that brings that brings me to to Beacon to Beacon itself. Like I'd like you to walk me through the chain of events that led that led you to wanting to wanting to hunker down and actually make the game. Oh yeah. It it's a it's a very simple one actually. Um I was playing Lancer Mm-hmm. And Lancer is a fantastic game. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, Lancer is a tactical mech-based game with highly modular characters. It's an amazing system, and reading the book, the way you build characters, I found myself designing and building characters for fun, and I haven't had that feeling since I was playing D and D Fourth Edition. Or like building a character, you know, looking at options and choices. No game in between there had grabbed my attention like that in in the designing characters just to make a build Mm -hmm. sort of style. So after playing Lancer for a while, I really liked the modular character building system. And I, I, I wanted to look and see, like, how would this work in a fantasy setting? Because Lancer is very much sci-fi, mech-based, 
Mm -hmm. But that idea of how you build characters in land. So I wanted to see if that could work in fantasy. So I started it out as, you know, just taking the basic Lancer mechanics, seeing how it would work. And yeah, you can just reflavor things. Um, but it was missing that logical connection. Why are you able to build modular characters in a fantasy setting? Um, and at that point, I was playing a lot of Final Fantasy fourteen, where mm -hmm. in that game, it's an MMO. And unlike World of Warcraft, for example, where... You have one character per class, and anytime you want to play a different uh, race or a different class, you make a new character. But Final Fantasy XIV, your one character can play any of the jobs in that game, and you just switch between them. Mm -hmm. And it, it has, you know, it has an explanation for how. But I was like, oh, Final Fantasy! It's like so many of these games have a job changing system or have that sort of built in logic for how you could do these things or quickly switch between these things. And then that's how final fantasy got merged into it. And then the development just continued from there being less of a like straight hack of Lancer and then starting to introduce the unique mechanics that beacon has in it. Like the, the phase battle system, mm -hmm. the reroll tables, uh, loot crates as a fun thing I put in there just because I like those. So yeah, mm -hmm. that, and it just became its own thing. Yeah. Um, when you were developing the concept of taking Lancer and tr and trying to hack it into a more fantasy based approach, did anyone bring up Icon to you? Yes. Uh, fun fun story. I had been working on Beacon for a while before I heard about Icon. Um, and by the time I heard about Icon, uh, they were getting pretty close to releasing their public play test for it. So when I heard that the Icon play test was released for, for the first time, it was with bated breath that I went and read the rules. Cause I, you know, it's by, by the person that made Lancer and I wasn't sure how similar it was going to be to Lancer. And mm -hmm. I was worried because if this is just a fantasy version of Lancer, it's going to be better than Beacon because it's by the person that has done it. They they would know this better. Uh, and it they would be two similar products. With kind of just, you would gracefully bow out at that point. But it's not fantasy Lancer. It's got mm -hmm. some similarities in the combat system, but it's its own unique thing. And I was very happy to read that because I was like, okay, I can keep doing what I'm doing with Beacon. These are, you know, you know, if you can think of them as derived from the original Lancer, but they are doing different things, which was very nice to hear. It's a fun mm -hmm. game too. I've played it as well now a few times. I like yeah. it. And with and for me person for me personally, even if it even if it was similar, I've never been fond of this idea that one particular game should be the game for a particular play style. Um, like there's there's another there's another Lancer like game that I've talked that I've talked about on this channel in the, in the past, um, Mahalika, and I'm butchering oh, the yeah, pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I co I covered the pre I covered the pre 1.0 version of about a year ago. And it's it is taking it is taking a it is very much still mechs, but it's more but first off it's mechs with a far more Filipino bent to it. Second off, it leans more into full on science fantasy weirdness instead of the instead of the mud and lasers approach of Lancer. Yeah. Even though, you know, Lancer does say mud and lasers and then they sneak in, you know, subtly. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of paracausal stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. Plus, well, all of all of the I'd hesitate. I would hesitate to 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 say that it leans into the mud and lasers science fiction when there's an entire company's selection of mechs that can be described as whiskey tango foxtrot. <laughs> Yeah, or hey, a core part of our story is our four machine minds thought into creation uh, this being of incomprehensible power that teleported the moon of Mars, I think, mm -hmm. away. Yeah, 
Um, I love the lore of it so much, but I love I I thoroughly enjoy how Lancer, you know, is sold that catch line mud and lasers. And I think it works really good as a tagline for here's the foundation of what you're thinking, because when you think about mechs, there are so many different styles and stories of mechs. So saying mud and lasers gives you a good foundation of mm-hmm. what to expect. And then you read it and then you see, oh, OK, they've got some spicy, cool things in here as well mm-hmm. which, is, which is really nice yeah now when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to when it comes to um beacon one of the things that you talk that you talk about in the pitch on the kickstarter page is characters being a point of light which there's that there's that fourth edition um dna i spotted yeah but also this also the concept of reflections which is an interesting motif because of, because of the fact that you look at say D and D, which has a shit or get off the pot attitude regarding what sort of fantasy it's supposed to be. Um, is the reflection meant? Is the reflection meant to be a way to accompany accompany different st- different styles of fantasy with dif- with different settings while still having the same feel? Yes. So even when you look at Final Fantasy, for example, mm-hmm. there's what fifteen games out right now, and not including the side games, which if we go not, into that, we'll be here all night. Exactly. But and so many of them, you know, most of them are set in their own unique worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, they just have common themes between them. Or, you know, even if yeah. they're just minor references, but they're all their own unique settings. A common mythos. Yeah, and I. I wanted to use something like that. Like I wanted how D and D has their multiverse, but every single setting is like a completely unique, distinct thing that has no connection to anything else except, you know, it's within the same cosmos. Mm-hmm. And I think that works for D and D, but I'm trying to t- like the game beacon is trying to tell like high fantasy stories where your you know, beacons, your points of light, people look up to you. And I wanted the games, like I didn't want to have one specific setting uh, because I know people like making their own settings. It's a fun part of running a game. So I went the reflection route where each each reflection, basically there's the source, which is where, you know, your entire all, beacon exists within the source. And within the source, there are basically a few key themes that are common throughout every single reflection of the source. So however you look at the however you look at the source, you're always looking at it from a different angle, a different reflection of it, but you're always going to have some of these common themes between it. Like there's always beacons, there's always a scourge. Um there's always magic in some way shape or form. Crystals are always important because I love crystals. Um and the point of each reflection and the intent is that when you play a game of Beacon with uh, with your group is that you would create your own setting together mm-hmm. and you would be filling in the blanks for each of those. So it's kind of the, those common themes are meant to make sure there's, you know, connections between all of these different reflections, but you could have completely different tones within them, completely different stories but anyone playing Beacon, you're all playing in the same, you know, essentially same shared setting, and they're all reflections of each other. And if you're talking with someone else that's playing Beacon, you know, you could ask them or you could talk about how your reflection is different than theirs, knowing there's going to be differences, but, you know, seeing how, you know, each of you handled your differences or how your worlds were different. And I really like that. And by the way, creating reflections together... I don't get to do it that much in play tests because I'm usually, you know, testing out the combat system to make sure it's balanced and everything. Mm-hmm. But boy, is making these different reflections so much fun. Mm-hmm. Like one of my favorite sessions I had the other day was we just made a reflection and it was such a cool setting. Like I'm really excited to run a few games in it and it's just so much fun to do. Yeah. And something something that i di- that i did notice is even though you have a, even though you have a class system the class system isn't as definitive as a lot of people would expect a class system to be 
it's one it's one part is one part of the of the equation especially get especially given the way talents work mm -hmm. um but it didn't get it didn't get past me that you do have a role system that's somewhat similar to what we saw in fourth edition or as i've nicknamed it the addition everyone expects me to hate, but I don't because the paycheck because the paycheck doesn't clear. <laughs> uh, to the point to the point where so somebody once asked me a long time ago why I, why I why I like fourth why I like fourth edition. I was like, you want you want me to dislike it? In the words of Goodfellas, "Fuck you, pay me." Uh, but, Mostly, yeah. mostly because I don't most, and the other thing is I like I like picking I like picking on um, grogs, traditionalists, whatever you, whatever you want to call them the the people the people who who think that it's a, that it's a treasonous act to take inspiration from video games. Yeah, and like my first D and D was three point five, and then after playing that for a few years, fourth edition came out, and I had read fourth edition and. You know, I didn't have as strong of a connection to 3.5. It was my first one, but it was cool to see, oh, it's a different edition, and it's basically a completely different game. It has the common, you know, elements with D&D &D that I recognize, Fireball, Wizards, you know, Fighters, but it's a different feeling game, and I really like that, and I loved building characters in that as well. And I also get why it wasn't everyone's cup of tea. Like, I didn't mind it. I really liked it. Um, and it's, it oh. seems like in, in recent, um, recently, uh, people have been starting to recognize some of the good things that fourth edition actually did or was trying to do. Maybe even if it didn't do it well, or if it didn't nail the landing, it still was trying to do some pretty cool things. I can, I can see that, especially, especially given how things like 13th age, Gubat Banwa, um, Unchained Heroes, and and most recently covered on this channel, Emberwind, are taking some of the things that Fourth Edition brought in and either refining it or doing their own spin on it. And of course, thir although um, Thirteenth Age has the benefit of having Hein of having um, Heinzo and Tweet work on it, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, there's there's de there's uh, Thirteen Age influences in this game as well in the uh, narrative narrative mm -hmm. play aspects of it the background system is mm -hmm. is very much how 13th age handles backgrounds which because it's a fun um, way of mm -hmm. like fleshing out a character and even on a character sheet seeing uh, like you could have a character backstory right mm -hmm. and a block of text isn't going to read immediately well not everyone's going to read that but just having like here is my character's name here are their background skills and the evocative type of background skills that you would make in 13th age or beacon. And then, you know, seeing your, uh, your one unique thing in 13th age beacon uses a title. Um, it's like a summary of a character. It like gives, it may not tell you everything about it, but it gives you a real quick like impression of what the character is, what they can do, maybe what they're like, which is really nice to see. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I know there's a lot I know there's a lot of classes that you have in just the playtest version alone, but I'd like to I'd like to kind of do a lightning round if you don't mind of go, of going through them and what sort of what sort of what sort of jobs in in Final Fantasy games um, might be might be a good might be a good analog for what it's doing. All right, I'll I'll try, and if I don't have one that I know. I might I I can just give maybe the inspiration for where this one came from because not yeah. every, not everything has a direct Final Fantasy analog that I know that I know of because I haven't played all of them. And I I might I might be I might be able to I might be able to pitch a couple given how for my own FF project I had to go through the entire franchise including all the mobile all the mobile inside stuff. Oh wow! Um, but I'll start with Aegis. Yeah, that didn't that didn't have one. I wanted a defender that could defend with magic. So mm -hmm. I wanted a magic defender and I'd like the idea of magical shields. So mm -hmm. I I know there are shield, I think 14. I play a black mage in Final Fantasy 14, so haven't touched any healers. But I 
I know there's barrier healers in 14. Sage is um, a barrier. Sage is kind of take cornered the market on barrier healing in the cur- in um cur- in current iterations. There we go. Oh. Uh, but next alchemist. Yeah, there's so many different types <laughs> of alchemists through oh. through everything. So I just wanted, you know, someone that uses potions. Um, the you know, chemist the job from items. tactics comes to mind for me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Arsenal. Uh, Final Fantasy 15's main character. Not the not. Noctis. I'm guessing you're referring to Noctis's um, armature unleashed ability. Yep. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was. I didn't want to do basic character classes like fighter or wizard i wanted things to be immediately more flavorful or impactful from that so like paladin for example i think paladin it immediately is flavorful it's it tells you more than just a fighter whereas Mm -hmm. fighter warrior they don't necessarily tell you anything um Mm -hmm. so i just wanted to think of your someone like someone that would fill that fighter niche but jam jam them full of flavor and just the idea of someone that summons a ton of weapons uh never runs out and just has an endless supply of weapons um was what i landed on uh, and you know noctis w- once i thought of that hey i remember playing a game where a character did exactly that <laughs> mm-hmm. assassin uh ninja rogue mm-hmm. i do like in the art that it looks like he's wielding energy kopeshes Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Berserker. <laughs> oh, anything. Any any barbarian rager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they all they all come to that. Actually, the um and the limit break for the Berserker is straight up inspired by uh fourth edition D and D's um Barbarian with the primal strike. Which I'm perfectly fine with because the Fourth edition barbarian, I thought I thought tapped into an interesting idea, and that is using rages to represent possession by animal spirits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a really cool way. Instead of just a person that is angry, mm-hmm. um, it added more to it, and, and that's the kind of angle I wanted to go for these. Like, yes, the berserker or uh, in this, you know, they're the get angry class, but in beacon where everyone has access to magic or is magical like all right well you your emotions literally fuel your etheric field and make you stronger so it doesn't have to be rage but it could Mm -hmm. be any strong emotion yeah uh and i i always laugh that that's the way the that berserker um was was had evolved into because do you know what berserker translates to Mm, no Bear shirt. Because ostensibly berserkers would be uh, would be go- would be going into battle high as balls. Yes, so I they, do remember that. They either they would either it because of, because translation with with old languages is difficult. It's not known whether it's whether it's supposed to be they went into battle with it with a bit with only a bear skin on. Or they went into bottle battle with no shirt with no shirt on. Either one is plausible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and either one is terrifying. Yep. Um, Chronomancer. Uh, that one I didn't have any direct Final Fantasy inspiration. Um, because I, I like time travel stories, and mm-hmm. I really just wanted to put someone that messes with timelines and time magic in there (laughs) well time mages have been a thing for quite a while and they've never been in any of the ones i played time magic is always in there (laughs) haste and slow but Mm -hmm. i've never had any of the specific time mages yeah um demon hunter uh world uh world of warcraft straight up uh world of warcraft's (laughs) demon hunter um uh not the not the class that they eventually released, but more of the Warcraft Three um, Demon Hunter unit was the inspiration for that. Because it it does seem that you go with the idea of a Demon Hunter is dancing on the razor's edge. Yeah, and you know, 
that sort of like edgy character is really attractive to people as well. But the yeah, you know, you've got to be the monster you hunt. Um, mm -hmm. you know, walking on that edge of corruption and the class, the class traits uh, support that as well. Where, you know, you're you're taking stress, which is one of your like, uh, you know, life resources, HP mm -hmm. or stress, and you want more because it lets you do cool things with it. But you know, too much, and you're at risk of taking injuries from your enemies. Yeah. Um, demonologist. Uh, warlocks, any, uh, any summoning class basically. So that was my, you know, any summoner sort of class stand in with the flavor of this is a class that doesn't care about their summons and they are expendable. <laughs> um, dragon rider. Dragoon. Yeah. <laughs> I figured that one was pretty obvious. Yeah, and I the only to. reason I didn't, and the only reason I don't call it dragoon is just because I feel like it would be too on the nose uh, to call it a dragoon. So I call it the dragon rider mm -hmm. and change the flavor a little bit so there are less dragon hunters. Because dragon hunter could be another way you could think of it, but I like the um, idea of having this relationship with a dragon because then your limit break you can summon your dragon. Mm -hmm. which I think people want the ability to summon dragons. <laughs> so next is the mystery of the Druids. Sorry, couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah. So that one was, that one was more of the D and D Druid. Um, mm -hmm. But I wanted it to focus on the spell casting aspect because I wanted it in D and D, you know, you've got either the spell casting Druid um, or the shape shifting Druid. And I didn't want one class to compete on that. So I split it into we've got the druid and we've got the shapeshifter. So if you want that traditional D&D &D shapeshifting druid, those are the two classes you're going to want to pull things yeah. from. Or in some cases, you have the druid who does both, which is the reason why Codzilla exists. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar, Codzilla was a, ter was, was a term that was, co that was coined... On uh, on the for, on the forums back in the days, it's it's short for cleric or druid. It was to reference the fact that an optimized cleric or druid who knows what they're doing is playing D and D on easy mode. They're in, they're an entire party all by themselves. Yeah, and in three point five, thinking of the summon spells, how they worked. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, e even wor even worse. The the drawback with um. With wild shape is that you're not supposed to, is that <clears throat> you're supposed to be unable to cast spells, but again, somebody who knows what they're doing can work around that. Yeah, um, Pathfinder made it even worse, <laughs> but and of course, but yeah, the, and stuff like that is one of the reasons why I went into this going. All right, Beacon has two modes of play. It has narrative play and combat play. Mm -hmm. They are distinct things that basically don't overlap with each other. If you're doing narrative play, great. We've got the rules light, uh, you know, quick ruling uh, dice, and you can kind of do whatever makes sense for you. But if we're going into combat play, separate mode of play, this is the tactical game portion of it. And, you know, the, these two things don't carry over. You could, you know, you can be an avian ancestry that can fly, you know, you've got wings. But in combat play, if you haven't brought the trait that lets you fly in combat, you can't mechanically gain the benefits of flight. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, flavor flying however you want. In narrative play, if it makes sense for you to fly, you can fly. But in combat, flight is a specific mechanic, and you need a thing that'll let you do it. Mm -hmm. um, Gravewalker. Uh, Death Knight. The ideas of Death Knights as a class. Mm -hmm. So I, I can certainly I can certainly see that, and I like how the art has what look what looks what looks like a shovel turned into a turned into a short spear or a battle axe. Uh, yeah, that would be one of their class unlocks. Uh, I believe it's called the Grave Digger Shovel. Mm -hmm. Um, Gunslinger. Yeah, uh, it's, I think Machinist in 14. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of uh, 
John Wick, a little bit of, um, oh, what was the Christian Bale one? From the Equilibrium. Movies? Equilibrium, yep. A little bit of that thrown in. Mm-hmm. Gun Kata. Yep. And I, I can, I can certainly, I can certainly see it. Um, Actually, Gun, Gun Kata got split off into its own unique yeah. talent tree. Yep. I, it used to be a part of the Gunslinger, and then it was just like, I think everyone should be able to get this. Mm-hmm. Um, Hexblade. Uh, D and D's Hexblade actually. Mm-hmm. I I can I can certainly see it. Although in, it and although this is more fo- this is more focused on the idea of curses from what from what I've seen of it than the um than the old version of the Hexblade, which was just which was just an early attempt at trying to make a gish. Yeah, and 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 that's what the class or the job is like. It's a gish class in this, except they are built that way on purpose. Like mm-hmm. the class is built that way. And because multi-classing is basically a core part of the game, you, that you, you got your two different things to look for when you mm-hmm. build it out. Yeah. Um, life. Weaver. But it was kind of, it was kind of thinking of like a warlock, but I wanted more than just a spell It's like, it mm-hmm. needs a little bit more. Yeah. Um, um, life, life weaver. That is my, um, so that would be any of the healers, you know, your white mage or whatever, but I wanted it to have a, sp- specific flavor because i was trying to get away from just pure simple things of like here's your you here's your healer class uh, mm-hmm. here's your white mage um it's just healer is general to me like fighter is so that's why i went with life weaver as like your battlefield medic that is actually like ditching you up on the battlefield and um has those offensive and defensive things that basically approach of like if you know so much about how the body works and how to heal people you can also probably harm them mm-hmm. oh harm assist is a thing um mm-hmm. paladin any other paladins <laughs> big tank i i threw in D D smite on there because people like being able to smite things uh but yeah pa- paladin i think is your is your basic is your most basic defender it's also a support role mm-hmm. as well in beacon but yeah just if you want to protect people uh with your body this is the class to do it mm-hmm. um phoenix uh any pyromancer but i didn't want to call it a pyromancer because that i that that I felt was too simple. So then the idea of a, you know, the Phoenix, the birth and resurrection, and still it has all of those fire damage over time effects, but mm-hmm. it, it has this flavor of the rising from the ashes and, you know, the positive, the pros and cons of fire instead of just what you would often normally have of just, I'd like, uh, you know, like to see things burn. Ha 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 ha. No, if you want that, the bright wizard is over there. <laughs> yeah, which you can still do. Your your phoenix is like that. It's just mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't want the standard uh, assumption for a lot of people to be. This is how it has to go. Yeah, um, rift blade. Um, that should be a unique one. Um, I don't know if there's anything. I'm not aware of anything that's like it. Um, but I wanted a class that used teleportation, was an artillery, and I really like the His Dark Materials books, mm-hmm. uh, the Golden Compass and everything, and most importantly, the Subtle Knife. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, where, that's where that class is, Rift Cutter and the idea of cutting portals uh, around the world came mm-hmm. from. Um, Rhyme Guard. Uh, any of your ice mages. Uh, but I, and this was one that came out. So uh, when classes were created in the lifespan of Beacon also influences what the inspiration was behind them. So some of the earlier ones like Phoenix, Lifeweaver, they were, uh, we want, we have a role that we want to fill and we mm-hmm. want to make sure, you know, people coming from this from D and D or familiar with fantasy have something that, that they can latch onto. That's familiar. Mm-hmm. Rhyme guard came out because it was a, all right, I, I have some of these core classes already designed. I want something that interacts with temporary hit points as a mechanic. 
Mm -hmm. And then the class being a class that gets frost armor to to grow on themselves or spread it out to their allies. That's then where Rheingard came from. So Mm -hmm. Rheingard came out from a, I have a mechanic I want a class to use. Mm -hmm. Um, Seeker. (laughs) D&D 4th edition Seeker. Which is is nice because I think I like the seeker concept. I just I just think it came out too late. Yeah, uh, and like I wanted that. So, so the seeker in this would would take the place, I guess, of the long distance ranger. Um, mm-hmm. But again, with that unique flavor of it being like you know we're redirecting things, never miss. Everyone else is accurate because of me, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um. Shadow Dancer. Oh, any of the 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 D and D Shadow Dancers, the Shadow Rogues, the mm-hmm. uh, uh, Assassin and Shadow Dancer have very strong synergy on purpose. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was kind of the 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 Dervish fighter mm-hmm. archetype, and kind of as uh, Shadow Dancer was was kind of the uh, class that came around that. Because we had we had assassin being the, you know the assassin I guess role, but then wanted mm-hmm. something for the other type of rogue play style, you know the combat rogue almost. Mm-hmm. Um, shapeshifter. That was the other half of the druid. For if you want to be shapeshifting, here you go. Mm-hmm. Um, scald. Bard. Is it spoony though? <laughs> Uh, Scald came out later because I wasn't sure if I was going to do a bard or not, uh, like a bard inspired class. So again, and Final Fantasy fourteen bard, obviously, mm-hmm. um, lots of bards in Final Fantasy. Um, I didn't want to call it a bard. I like the the flavor I have out of this is more you know on the battlefield, you know the battlefield Scald. Um, I thought that fit with Beacon more, and and just to help separate a little bit from. Um, and at the very least from D's perception of a bard. Although truth be told, from what I see of the skull that has more of the DNA of the fourth edition D D um bard than th- than third, fifth, or A D D. That is correct. Um I like that one best. Um Thunderclaw. Uh that would be your monk. Um and I was then trying to, I wanted more than just monk because also just the, uh, the issues associated with just having, you know, Hey, here's your middle, you know, your, your Eastern style martial artist with all of these other things. Um, I, I wanted a little more flavor for that similar to fighter. And we needed a, we, we didn't have any class that used a lightning as an mm-hmm. element yet. So it was like, ooh, these work really well together. Yeah. Boom, Thunderclaw. And for me, an, for me, an issue that I've had with a lot of games that do a monk class is this, is this idea that there's a one-size-fits-all um, fighting style. Like I've, jo- I've jokingly responded to the, to the whole I know kung fu thing with, okay, which one? Seriously, which one? There's like 1,500 of them. Yeah, Monk is just a different flavor of fighter, essentially. Like, fighter, you know, uh, Barbarian and Monk are all fighters. Mm-hmm. But they all get spun into their own unique thing. Because, and again, because of D&D's unique history, that's that's why it's there. But that's why I wanted to do something different with it. Yeah. Hence the Thunderclaw. Um, Tidecaller. Uh, so that one, um, a little bit of, uh, a little inspired by like Final Fantasy X and Yuna, not, not from any of their mechanics, but the idea of water, a water mage mm-hmm. and having water be an actual element that you would use mm-hmm. separate from ice. Yeah. Um, Warden. d and Warden. Loved that class. <laughs> it was so unique. It's, it certainly was a lot. It is the the joke that the joke that I've uh, made when it came to the warden is I am the warden. I speak for the trees, and the trees tell you to fuck off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that 
to me, Warden in fourth edition felt like a class that was designed with the fourth edition mechanics in mind. Like it really felt like it leaned into those, like just the simple idea of how saving throws worked in that system. And then they like break the rule on saving throws and they get that extra advantage Mm -hmm. by getting to roll ahead of time. Just simplicity, but it was so unique to that class, obviously. I Mm -hmm. just loved that. And Warlord, I have a bit of a guess. (laughs) Yeah. God, I loved me a 4E Warlord. I, I, needed a fourth edition warlord in this game yeah and the the jo- the joke when it comes to when it comes to warlords is a barbarian hits you with his axe a warlord hits you with his barbarian uh because i think i think it i th- i think the reason why the why the warlord struck a chord with so many people is that it filled a niche that hadn't been that they didn't know they wanted filled this idea of the of the battlefield commander or the battlefield tactician, mm-hmm. oh. and it felt great. Like mm-hmm. it did its thing really well. Mm-hmm. And it it was one of those things. It was one of those classes where if you were playing a warlord, your ability, like you got to do the thing you wanted to do. You got to give people bonuses, command people to do things. It didn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if they succeed at that or not. That's their character, and that's what they're doing. Your job is to enable those things. Mm-hmm. And, like, if you're, you know, if you were playing the rogue or a fighter, like, if your job is to be making attack rolls, and if you're missing, that feels bad. But the warlord, you're usually able to, and you, to do your thing, which is getting people in positions, setting people up, doing things. And if you had that like tactical mindset, like especially if that mm-hmm. was a thing you were interested in, just it hit all those right buttons. Yeah. And there's a few there's a few jobs from FF14 that I'd be curious how you would how you would um interpret them into the into the sandbox that you have with Beacon. Okay. Um the main one, the main one that I'm thinking of with this is the samurai. Okay, so so that's actually an interesting question because I wouldn't create the samurai as a class. I would create them, and uh, spoiler alert: I've been looking at this, you know, as homebrew or later releases actually. Uh, but I would create that as an alternate job for another class. Like, so, like the way, um, like the way archetypes work in Pathfinder. Yeah, or more, or more closely, like how alt frames work in Lancer. So you would take, for example, let's say the Arsenal class. Level one in Arsenal gets you a couple of unlocked like abilities, and that you can equip. And the Arsenal job, you pick up level one in the Gravewalker. You unlock a couple of abilities and you unlock the Gravewalker job and you can choose to equip either of those. Mm -hmm. I would do it so that the samurai or whatever I call it, because I wouldn't call it a samurai, um, that would be an alternate job of, let's say, the arsenal. So that when you get level one with the arsenal class, you could choose to gain either the arsenal job or the samurai job. So the job would have its, you know, it would have stats and traits that are different from the arsenal, but then the rest of the unlockables would be the same. So I don't, I don't necessarily, and you could do it as its own class, but I feel like what would make the samurai unique could be captured in a few, in a few traits and would it need an entire class line by Mm -hmm. itself to really get that feel you could do it absolutely but the other problem with introducing a new class you know with with all the class levels the the maximum class levels is because it's a modular system any character any build can then take things from that class and you're now need to make sure that whatever would be in this new samurai class you know, would it be broken if it's brought into this build or combined with this class? So having mm-hmm. it be just an alternate job 
I think would solve a lot of those problems as well. And I, I see that as a solution for a lot of ideas or like, like the idea of prestige classes in the other D&D editions where this is a cool idea, but it doesn't, it's not a full class in and of itself. A problem that I had with prestige classes is the amount of pre-planning you needed to do in order to get it. Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of false choice. An, ex an example that I use with false choice is I remember back in FF11, the warrior could technically equip any weapon that they wanted, but you're going to be equipping axes. You're yeah. going to be equipping great axes because it's because it's going to give you the most benefits to your playstyle, which is why it doesn't surprise me that the Marauder and later the Warrior in fourteen just skip just skips the foreplay and goes straight to great axes. Yeah, all the Final Fantasy four killing fourteen classes do that, where it's you don't have different types of weapons. It's just if you are a red mage, these are this is the weapon you use, the red mm -hmm. mage weapon. Yeah. You're the warrior, you use the two-handed axes. Mm -hmm. uh, two-handed axes. Paladin, you got your sword and shield. Like like you, no differences in those those equip in those equipments, which I think is great from like a balancing gameplay element in an MMO like that. Mm -hmm. Um in a tabletop game though, I really like those you know, finding different equipment or switching out different things, so that's why Beacon does have the ability to you know, it has all of these different items that you can unlock or get through loot and, you know, combine with these different builds or characters that you can create. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think I know the answer to this, but Black Mage. Oh, uh, so that was one of the stretch goal classes, actually, that got unlocked. Um, so that is going to be called the Equinox. And it is going to, it, it's hard to, it, it was very hard to get a black mage feel in beacon with the way mana works in beacon mm -hmm. and damage. Um, but it does have a like sun and moon mechanic where you're going into one of these two phases where there's a cost associated with each one. So sun phase, your AOEs are bigger, but your AOEs cost more mana. Uh, or a moon phase where it, mana regen doesn't work well in beacon, like it would kind of be busted. Mm -hmm. um, so instead it has a, like you get even more range on things, but the but you would start taking stress if they're too far away. So each of the phases has a pro and a con, mm -hmm. and it's an artillery class that wants to stay in one spot. It gets benefits if it stays in one spot and wants to hit things up from far away or explode things from far away. Yeah. And we just started testing it. it it's looking, it's looking fun. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. liking how this goes. And I, I was, I'm a black, black mage main as well. So yeah, uh, it was fun to be able to get that unlocked. I was really um, excited about that. Blue mage. That's a tricky one. So <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so that I actually have basically as a talent tree. Um, so I have a talent called copycat that lets you do some of those blue mage things. And I just straight up have a note on it that says, Hey, this is a talent that's meant for fun, casual play. Check with your GM before you use this, because this could be busted and I'm not going to try to balance it so that it's not because mm -hmm. that's the fun of being a blue mage. Yep. Like it could be busted. Here's here's a talent tree that you can use uh, if you want to pursue that path. Just make sure that this is something a GM would allow. Because mm -hmm. the blue mages are that sort of thing where you kind of have to balance everything around that. And I don't want to balance everything around that one <laughs> character idea. I'd rather just give them fun toys to play with and just put that warning out there for yeah. anyone running with it. Um, Dark Knight. Ooh, good one. Uh, yeah, that was another stretch goal. That was our last stretch goal class that we unlocked. Um, that is going to be called the Nightmare. And mm -hmm. that is going to be a grapple defender sort of base class with a lot of 
dream magic, nightmare magic associated with it to, mm -hmm. to really get that idea of getting in there, locking people down and being a terror for, for your enemies. Mm -hmm. um, Astrologian. That, oh, how would I? So I haven't played it. I know the, the basic mechanic of it. I would I would probably look into doing that as maybe an alt like my first approach is always look at it as an alt job before doing a full class. Um, but if I was doing a job for that, I would probably just look at something about how about how to incorporate a deck. Like a deck of playing cards of some sort as a mechanic for it. I don't know mm -hmm. how, but that I I would probably do something along those lines just because that that's what it does. <laughs> Yeah, and I, of, co of course, if you don't want to use the deck of cards, you could always double. You could always double down on the idea of so of somebody who manipulates fate. Um, yes. Red mage. That's, an that's another idea I'd I'd want to play around with. Yeah. Red mage. I. So red mage, I wouldn't do. I don't think I would do as a job by itself i think the idea of a red mage is something you can build yourself in beacon anyway and a number of people have done red mage inspired builds out of the existing classes so the way i would do that is i would look at the spellblade talent tree mm -hmm. that gets you a lot of the feel of red mage right there um and then something like hexblade because red mage is kind of the gish it's a gish class Mm -hmm. um and hexblade is the best suited for that right off the bat i think so just like combine that and spellblade talent tree and i think you've got yourself a red mage yeah. without needing to do anything specific and you can then flavor it like whatever kind of red mage you want do you want to be healing and damaging magic control magic and um weapon like whatever combos you want mm-hmm um, Gunbreaker. Hmm. So I, so I did play some Gunbreaker. So you could do it with the Gunslinger. If you did like a melee Gunslinger and picked up the Arsenal's Power Stone, which is a reloading melee exploding attack, that works pretty well, actually. Um, but as its own class, I would probably do some sort of resource around the cartridges um, and have those be things that you could use for different effects, um, like expand cartridges to gain focus or like put up a defensive barrier, knock someone back, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, dancer. 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 It would probably be an alt job of the Scald. Um, you know, I might do something more along the lines of Fire Emblem's Dancer and have it be something that like refreshes 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 things for your mm -hmm. allies. Um, like refreshes reroll table uses or like gives extra movement you'd have to be careful about giving people extra actions, but you know, so something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Reaper. Hmm. So I haven't played the Reaper at all, but it looks really cool. For me, um, a, a lot of the Reaper feels like it's a reincarnation of the FF 11 death, not death Knight, um, dark Knight. Since the if the signature weapon for warriors was great axes, the signature weapon for dark knight dark knight was scythes. Okay, so here's the thing about reaper. Reaper, like the samurai, is something I am creating an alt job for. Like I'm looking at creating an alt job. Um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be directly off of the Final Fantasy fourteen version, and it would be more. Let's say it's more Bleach Shinigami inspired, but it would lean into invisibility as its um, core mechanic. 
Mm-hmm. And basically being a mobile Grim Reaper on the battlefield. Yeah. Now, you talk about quest-based leveling on the Kickstarter. What does that entail? Real simple. So the game is built around, like, you go on quests, you do things, and that's how you're going to progress your story. Like, some of your story is going to be progressed through the quests, and some of it's going to be during your downtime scenes. Um, But when you go on a quest, whether you succeed or fail at that quest, you are going to gain a level. It doesn't matter whether you succeeded or failed. There's no experience point tr- uh, tracking. Your leveling is just based on completing quests. Every quest mm-hmm. you complete, you will get a level and you will get a loot crate. And you, there's other things your GM can give you as well, like if they want to give you gold. It, there's, there's not like an economy like D&D where you know, you're, you're buying swords and shields. But um, you know, like basically, it's fun money to buy little fun toys with uh, mm-hmm. for the game. But yeah, so that's 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 quest based leveling is every quest. That's how you gain levels. And this, it's intended that you would structure your stories around that as well. Mm-hmm. Now, since it's a major aspect, I'd like to talk about the phase system, because the thing that instantly came to mind when I saw this phase design is one. I feel like I feel like this is a, a, t- a attempt to shift away from the role for initiative uh, mindset that a lot of a lot of games and a lot of game designers have. And two, I was reminded of the phase system that's used in stuff like Rollmaster or or its uh, or its inspirations like against the Dark Master. So, one of the inspirations for this came from it was a game called Old School Hack. And mm-hmm. the idea of the channeling and releasing um like it was it that inspired it mechanically it works differently but the reason there's a phase based system though is uh the, the specific reason is in a game like this there are a lot of things that you can do there's a lot of actions mm-hmm. um and this is something i ran into running games with of lancer for new folks is initiative in lancer is real simple pc turn npc turn and you take turns but if you're new to the game, when it's your turn, everything is available to you. And there is a potentially overwhelming number of options that are available to you. And I wanted to I, I wanted to not have that be an issue for people that were new to the game, especially if people weren't familiar with Lancer. Um, so I, I used the phase system as a way of breaking down what you can do into smaller chunks of time. So phase one rolls around. Hey, who wants to go during phase one? You can either recover or bolster, or you can either recover or defend. No one needs to do that. Okay. Phase two, anyone need to channel something? Yes. All right. You're going to start channeling. No enemies here. All right. Phase three. And, and it would go like that. Uh, and then once I had the idea of breaking it down into a phase system like that, then I could design the enemies around that, and then you know the actions you can take, breaking them, breaking them out into that, and that way you can now have these interesting uh, strategic decisions about. All right, do I go later? Like, do I go almost as slow as possible so I can get a full attack and attack twice? But if I do that. This baddie is going to go before me and might knock out my friend. So um, should I decide to do something that you know won't get me as many attacks, but has the option of maybe stopping that enemy from attacking a friend or you know knocking them out entirely? And there's a lot of cool strategic options that, options that open because NPCs don't use that system in the same way as PCs do. Each NPC has their own set initiative number. So you know, all right, the rogue goes during phase three, for example. I don't know if that's true. The charger goes during phase four. The titan goes during phase seven. So you know when the enemies are going to take their turns and can plan and strategize around that. Mm-hmm. Now, given the given the whole three le- whole three level thing, um, one question that I was going to ask, but it's kind of answered by the way the character sheet is designed, is. 
is it is this a system that's me that's meant that's meant for that's that's meant to have a low level cap the way um i had covered a game called masters of the metaverse a long time a fair time back and that has that does not even though it uses fifth edition's rule set to a, to an extent um it caps everything off at 10th um yeah so no. beacon beacon has a max level of 12 mm -hmm. um i do think it would be rare for a game to run to all 12 levels um i know like kind of when people are building characters you know like building characters for fun you're kind of looking at around you know level three or level six for like builds like just just as like baselines like by level six is when you could get you, you know most of your builds would be fully off the ground like whatever you want them to do they'd be capable of doing that by around level six mm -hmm. um so the game has up to 12 levels i don't expect most games to run that long um and i definitely wouldn't like i had fewer levels originally and then people were just like everything's in threes can it please be 12 just so that we can have numbers divisible by three easily uh so i i put it back up to 12 but yeah i don't see people going that long especially for an indie game like i i see level six as being kind of the max that people would probably do i think people should go absolutely more than that but the, the fun thing about a game like beacon though is your power isn't necessarily increasing with all of the levels it's more of your options and your flexibility is increasing you have more options available to you for how you build your character you have more mm -hmm. choices that you can bring in but you're not necessarily any stronger at level nine than you were at level six mm -hmm. like you're moderately stronger but again it's not 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 like D and D sort of power curve. No, and I've I've done a video about I've done a video addressing the narrative of, about um about people not playing at high levels because I'm not I and when I did that video I wasn't all that interested in whether or not that is true but why people think that way because I could argue I could argue just I could argue until I'm blue in the face about it being false and somebody could argue just as much about it being true. And we'd get nowhere. Mm -hmm. Now, you've had you've had this in playtest form for a fair bit of time. What would you say are some of the takeaway lessons that you've gotten from the from the playtest experience so far? So, I think the most pivotal thing is was when I used to have enemies use the same uh same combat initiative system as the pcs did where like the enemies would use the phases like if an enemy was going to defend they would do it in phase one if they were going to hit you with a melee attack they would do it in phase five mm -hmm. and that was a nightmare to run because it works really well for pcs if you have one character and your choices are being broken down you know point by point but if you're running the game and you've got five npcs suddenly every npc is making that decision point on every single phase and it, it just became a nightmare uh and that's that led to the npcs having their set initiatives which ends up feeling better because it's a public thing that the players can see and plan around mm -hmm. um so that was definitely one of them the the other main things are mostly just around what feels good or what feels bad for a player like there's been different mechanics where like hey let's try this and like yeah on paper it might seem like this is balanced among other options but it just doesn't feel good or this doesn't feel impactful enough and that's a lot of the balancing of the game is just you know trying to make sure people feel like they're having fun like like there's not you know traps out there that like oh because i took this this is a terrible idea like you know going down weapon to focus talent trees or whatever like the, the the goal is that you cannot build a bad character in beacon unless you're purposely trying to like if you have no idea what you're doing it's your first time and you're just throwing things together you're going to have a perfectly good character mm -hmm. and that that's the that's the goal so and then the secondary goal is and is it fun to play yeah 
And I'm glad to hear that because as somebody who's who is a veteran of third of third edition, you're probably familiar with some with some of third edition's traps. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say I'd say an easy an easy instance. Of, I I some I sometimes joke that the feat system in third in third edition hat is is not is not a gameplay mechanic. It's a it's walking through a minefield or it's it's um it's got more it has more <laughs> it has more traps than an episode of Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the other thing as well that that happens at at, at least in my opinion, of course, um, is the push and pull between if you're building a character for a campaign is hey this is really good for my build for combat but here's another talent that really fits in the narrative that i'm building for the you know role-playing scenes but it's useless any other time and you know stuff like that is why i'd like the separation of all right you build a character for narrative you build a character for combat so you don't you don't have to run into those situations of, oh, you know, do I pick this because it's flavorful or do I pick it because it makes me, you know, slightly better at hitting things? And is the thing that I pick going to screw me over three sessions down the road? Yeah. So that's uh, I'm glad you brought that up as well, because uh, because characters are so modular in this game, you know, you're you're able to reequip everything, you know, whenever you go on a new quest, change your job, change your equipment. That's fine. I also have like a downtime activity in there so that if you want to do a full respec of your character, you can do that. Like if you just go, you know what? I just want to, I like this character, but maybe I feel like I I'm done playing this class. You know, everything I've picked is defender. I'm kind of done being a defender. I'm not having fun with it. Or maybe you're like, Hmm, you know what? Uh, my gym, I made a really cool build, and my GM has come to me and said, "Hey, your character is great. The narrative is fun, but the like, th- like this interaction is broken or something, or like with the class, it's stepping on someone else's toes." Mm-hmm. You can just respec everything about your character, and that's a part of the game that you are open to and are welcome to do if you want for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to like, ah, oh, I have to retire the character and I'll bring in a new character. You can do that if you want. But if it's just about, you know, hey, I made these choices uh, two months ago and I'm not happy with them anymore. Mm-hmm. Just change everything. You're the same character. Go ahead. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window and how big do you think the book is going to get it? at the rate things are going. So I am aiming to have this, uh, uh, a done version in people's hands, um, by September of next year. So the, the game has been in development for two years. Um, the book is a little over 400 pages and I don't expect it to be much bigger than that. Like aside from like the increases from formatting and, you know, artwork and everything. Um, but I don't want it to balloon more than this size because it's already a pretty, pretty beefy book. I don't think you want to go full Hero System 6th edition. <laughs> How big was that? Um, are, you asking, are you asking the whole rules or just character creation? Oh, jeez. <laughs> that, that probably tells me enough already. Because character uh-huh. creation was about 600 pages. Yeah, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Uh, In all fairness, I, Hero System is a universalist game. You aren't like I, ex- I expect universalist games like GURPS or Savage Worlds or what have or have them to be bigger, just because of all the stuff they have to account for. Yeah, but Savage Worlds is a nice slim book. It's great. Well, Savage Worlds is a special exception, but GURPS and Hero are the infamous ones when it comes to trying to encompass everything. I still oh, like okay. both of them, even though even though I like even though I keep picking on um, on GURPS fans because they keep insisting it's the only RPG you need. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which, to be fair, it's a free country, and you are free to be wrong. But yeah, the so I mean Beacon. Yeah, it's not going to be much bigger than it currently is. Uh, I, I specifically want to keep it 
um, from ballooning in size. But yeah, the plan is September of next year to have it, the finished version in people's hands. But it's been in public playtest. Uh, that's not going to change. And the player-facing rules are always going to be uh, free for everyone. Mm -hmm. So the plan is just as this continues in development to keep having those playtest versions available for everyone. And at some point, it'll just be here. Here is the... Yeah, it's never going to be finished. But here's the finished version. This is what's going to be in the print copies. You know, he... Uh, Here's the PDF. If you want to play the free version, here's everything in the free version. It's all the player facing stuff. Like the only thing that the paid section, the paid product will have will be the GM facing stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the intent is if you want to play beacon, there won't be anything keeping you from playing it. Yeah. And I, I can certainly appreciate that. Oh, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of scheduling to come all the way to, to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. I really appreciate you inviting me on and letting me talk about this. I'm very excited to be doing this, so mm -hmm. being able to talk to people about it is fun, so thank you. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, then maybe next time. Maybe next time we'll crack a cold one. Mm -hmm. With the boys. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!